Okay, great. Well, Alistair, thank you for the introduction. Um, like Basel III, and a lot of you have heard me talk about Basel III, and I was ridiculed in the industry for a long time talking about the new banking regulations, um, and, and it turned out actually they had an impact. I've been talking about the pilot shortage for a while, um, and once again, people thought I was a little crazy, um, and again, here we are, we're actually facing a pilot shortage, at least we think, and that's part of the topics we're going to be talking about today. Um, but I was asked to present to our clients uh, two months ago the biggest issues in business aviation. And this topic, people, was the most single, in my opinion, greatest topic to talk about because it has the greatest import to our clients. Why? Because it's about the experience and people make the experience. Um, people in this industry make the experience for us as well. And we're at a juncture in the industry right now, which we're gonna uh, dive into. But before we dive into it, what I'd like to do is to have each one of our panelists introduce themselves. And Will, why don't you introduce yourself first? Hello. Um, right, William Finden calling from Oakland's Global. Um, we're a business aviation recruitment consultancy. At any one point in time, we're recruiting between uh, in 20 to 30 different countries worldwide. Uh, we might be recruiting pilots one day, engineers the next. Um, we typically work across business aviation, commercial aviation, and the rotary industry. And um, let's then go to Jonathan. Uh, so Jonathan Camworthy, uh, CA Europe. Uh, I'm the uh, group leader for sales uh, across uh, Europe, managed team of uh, two regional sales managers looking after this region. Um, CA is a global training provider uh, and simulator and um, technology provider to, uh, to healthcare, to commercial aviation, defense and security, and business aviation. So my role is specifically in business aviation uh, and looking after the clients here. Great, thank you, and Liz? I'm Liz Mosscrop. Hello, everybody. I'm CEO of Gear Up Media. We do video and live streaming magazine shows for the aviation industry. And I'm here today in my capacity of president of Women in Aviation UK. We're forming part of a great new initiative called Women in Aerospace and Aviation UK. It's a charter which I'm cordially going to invite all of you to be part of, and it's how to bring in more women and introduce the topic of diversity to our people skills shortage. Great, well, thank you. Um, about five years ago, I was sitting in the office of the uh, chief pilot for American Airlines in Chicago, and I asked him about the pilot shortage. And he looked at me, he laughed. He said, what pilot shortage? He pointed at his desk and there was a stack about a foot thick of resumes. He said, we're never gonna have a pilot shortage. We got too many pilots. We don't know what to do with all the pilots. Well, obviously um, he was either lying or it was a glib answer or just not that bright. I'd hate to think that United would have a guy who's not that bright as their chief pilot. But here we are five years later and indeed we think there's a shortage. And one of the <coughs> firms that's been in the forefront of the shortage because they do a lot of training in the space is CAE. Um, CAE has some interesting data uh, that we're looking at, and um, what I'd like to do is to actually have Jonathan walk us through a few slides that we've got right now. So if we could cue the first slide, and Jonathan, why don't you walk us through these three slides, and, or four slides, and so everybody sort of has a big picture first. Absolutely, so I think to start off, uh, I think the key thing is here is uh, we, there is a shortage of pilots um, in aviation, uh, as you clearly said. I don't think it's a shortage of pilots, but a shortage of good, high quality and skilled pilots. So um, we, we seem to get many CVs for, for job postings, but not enough hours um, for, for the operators that, that we're looking for. So um, this is a quick timeline um, of the, the, the numbers of, uh, of uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, freight, uh, carried in the world over the last 50 to 60 years. Uh, as we can see, the, the need for, uh, for pilots uh, is, is increasing year over year. Um, next slide. And one quick comment on that slide. Um, I don't know how many people of you looked at different growth rates for different industries, but suffice it to say, for 60 years, I've rarely seen an industry that grows in its annual capacity by three to 5% on, uh, uh, on a CAGR basis. Every single year, except for the year of SARS, this industry grew fairly dramatically. So that sets the stage, increasing industry, um, and we're gonna find out what the ingredients that actually creates the acute part of that shortage. And Jonathan? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, utilization has, has gone up by 2% year over year. As, uh, as Ford said, 3 to 5% year over year for the last 60 years is, uh, is unprecedented, really. Um, ever, um, always uh, evolving. Um, we're seeing less aircraft for sale. I was speaking last night to someone on the, at the dinner. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, we were looking at inventory sales uh, at around about 11%. So the fact that this has gone down to under 10% now is, is great. Um, and with the global uh, 7500 and the G650 coming out in recent years and the, uh, the ATEX, we're looking at uh, more pilots for these aircraft. Uh, typically, these aircraft are crewed with, uh, with at least four, four pilots. So we're, we're evolving from, from three pilot aircraft to four or five pilot aircraft. So uh, so yeah, as obviously the uh, the need for for more pilots, uh, the the passenger traffic uh, increasing uh, five percent over year over year. Um, direct city pairs to over twenty thousand now. Uh, we're seeing a lot more uh, point to point uh, operations, um, especially in commercial aviation now with uh, with the uh, the. Lot further distance, long distance aircraft like the Dreamliners and the uh, the A three fifties. So what, um, what does that mean for the new pilot's demand? So obviously, we, uh, we discussed this uh, just before we came on. We, about 40 years ago, we had a, a really, really high influx um, of, of military personnel coming into aviation. We're not seeing that influx of people come into uh, to our uh, industry at the same rate as we, we did see. So that is having a huge effect um, on the pilot shortage at the moment. Um, the growth of the pilot population is driven by the active fleet and the evolution of crew ratios. We're actually seeing in business aviation a lot of our operators, because they can't find uh, the, the, the personnel that they need, they're going down from four pilots to three pilots on some aircraft and from three pilots to two pilots. Um, just because they can't find the quality personnel uh, that they're looking for. So if obviously that has an effect on, uh, on, on crews, on, on revenue for CAE as well. So normally 4% of retirements every year and 4% have uh, moved to commercial aviation. We're seeing a lot of uh, Far Eastern carriers like, uh, like the Middle East carriers and uh, the Far East in Asia. They're offering uh, very attractive packages uh, for people and uh, more importantly stability for a lot of pilots uh, that they're not currently getting in, in business aviation. Um, we're, we're seeing a view to uh, the need that we're going to need 40 more pilots in business aviation in the next 10 years and 100 110,000 in new pilots in commercial aviation. So the, uh, the need for pilots at the moment is, is bigger than ever. So we've seen some interesting data here that says we have a problem, but do we really have a problem? Or peer, are, are companies um, and, uh, that own aircraft or operate aircraft uh, now facing a, a, a shortage of technicians and or pilots or both? Uh, you know, Will? Um, yeah, I mean, I've been saying this for the last four or five years now, but if I had 50 qualified licensed engineers, I'd probably place them all tomorrow. There's a huge demand globally for engineers, and we typically see them, or we have in certain trends going from Europe to the Middle East and now to Asia. Um, there's bigger salaries there. Um, there's more opportunity, and it's somewhere different to work. Um, we're also seeing a big change looking at corporate to commercial is a lot of people are moving over now to the commercial airlines, bigger salaries, uh, more flexibility, more obvious rosters, and, uh, and I suppose the most important thing is the, the work-life balance. I think um, corporate business aviation, um, there's a lot expected from you, particularly from the pilot side of things, and people are finding it a lot more attractive in the commercial airline side. And um, just moving, Liz, um, how do we solve the problem? I mean, is this, do you see real being a problem or is there a solution to it in your mind, uh, both the, techno the technician as well as the pilot shortage? I, I can see a solution to part of the problem. And part of that is as an industry, we're still very dominated by guys. And I say that first and foremost by saying thank you very much to all of the guys in the room who many of you have given me my breaks and career breaks and are incredibly supported and supportive. So I think we need to have more of a conversation on what's happening because we've got a pool of people that are in the world today. I think we have 53% um, women to men alive. And it seems to me that when we're in an industry where we've got 
25% at most of us are female, then we're losing out on attracting talent in and we need to get into some conversations, not the same old conversations that we've always had about why aren't there so many women in, more start, let's ask better questions. What do we need to do to bring more women in? What do we need to do? Because I still hear stories from women in our group in women in aviation who are pilots that are still, they're not great. They're not great. So what do we need to do? Because I, I believe that educated people here and talented people here, we're human beings first and foremost. We do want an inclusive industry. So we need to be producing um, advertising, we need to be into schools, we need to be talking to women at a very early age and kids at very early age how to get them in and when we go into universities, how do we include the conversation to bring more women into these more technical skills and roles? That would be my part of the I, I think what you're really talking about is diversity with a small d being, you know, uh, and I look at the banking industry, the number of avenues that the large banks have been recruiting um, both around the world, both, you know, with respect to women and upping the recruitment of women as well as minorities, and I mean minorities, not just skin color, but backgrounds, educational differences, as well as uh, economic differences, and, and we've, at least at City, we've had a tremendous success with our diversity recruiting campaign, because how are you going to replace all the baby boomer bankers? Well, you need younger bankers, and that's one of the greatest ways to get the most qualified talent pool. One way to solve the problem, Jonathan, what's CAE doing to address this issue? It's part of your business plan and what you guys do. Can you sort of give us some background that will, you know, I, I think it will help at least everybody in the audience understand the depth of the problem and, and really what people are doing to try and solve it? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, so CAE, uh, five, five years ago, maybe, maybe six years ago now, purchased uh, Oxford Aviation Academy. Uh, already have a location in Oxford, uh, location in Phoenix, and they're also looking at uh, opening a new location in Southern Europe uh, to help with the pilot demand that we have at the moment. The other thing that we're looking at doing is um, uh, the, what, what pilots need uh, to enter into, busy, in, into a career is they need a pathway, they need a guaranteed pathway. Um, and what we're seeing with all the cadet programs that we're seeing for the commercial airlines like British Airways and EasyJet, um, we're, we don't have anything like that for business aviation. So at CAE what we're doing is we're going to create a cadet program for business aviation pilots. So. It, should they choose to and should they be selected, they'll be offered uh, at least a one-year contract with CA on a business jet type once they've completed their ab initio training. And then what the opportunity is then to, to help with the pilot shortage, our operators will then be able to hire them as one of their line pilots afterwards. So what you're saying, the solution to the problem is to train more people. Let me ask you a question. How long does it, how long does it take and how much does it cost to train a pilot? How long is a piece of string? <laughs> um, the, the rough estimated cost is anything between 110 and 150,000 pounds to train a new pilot. So uh, the other thing that we, uh, I discussed with Will just before we came in, I'm actually uh, looking at doing my PPL later this year. Um, unfortunately, I won't be doing it in the UK. Uh, because the cost is about £12,000, but in the US, uh, I can do it for at least half that cost um, and have perfect weather conditions and be able to fly uh, pretty much of all hours of the day. So um, the, there is a huge cost element to it. Um, and, and unfortunately, a hundred, without the bank of mum and dad, a lot of people cannot afford to, to support 110000 unless they've got that guaranteed career to go to afterwards. So, Will, when we talk about the technician shortage, um, you know, I, I get the impression, at least, at least my personal view, is that it, it's easier to train technicians for less money for a shorter period of time. Is that right? Can we solve the problem just with training, or do we have a bigger problem coming down the road? Um, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you. I think it costs a lot more money to train a pilot, absolutely. I think more importantly, though, is we need to be approaching people about this much earlier on in life is the answer. Um, you know, you don't decide to become a vet when you're at university, and I think that those people that have a passion for aviation or aerospace really need to be approached at a much younger age um, to encourage them to go through the ranks. Um, I don't know how many people, I don't know what percentages are kind of self-funded from a pilot side of things, but it's going to be a lot more expensive to do that than to become an engineer. 
Well, you, you raised an interesting uh, point that I'll follow up in a moment, but Liz, um, are we facing a shortage of just pilots and technicians or other uh, areas in, in, aero, in business aviation right now? Well, I think lots of areas, but if I may, I'd like to just say that I'm working with CAE on an initiative to bring more, um, to promote how to pilot training as a career, and CAE have got five female cadet sponsorships that they're taking right from ab initio to the cockpit, and um, it's going to be very widely and heavily promoted across social media. It's going to aim at younger people and have the young women who are selected to be ambassadors. So that's one of the things that CAE is doing and I think can really help to attract people to address Will's point. And another thing, I think we're such an innovative industry and I'm really surprised that we haven't had more disruption around funding. We're just going either bank of mum and dad or very, very few scholarships and we're looking to the same sources. And this probably won't fly well in a business aviation room, but you know, I look at, I go into somewhere like Heathrow Airport and I see HSBC spending millions and millions of dollars on advertising at airports. Couldn't we take some of those dollars and to use it into some training anyway? And some, uh, there must be better ways of financing pilot training than what we're doing at the moment. So the last time I was in Hong Kong, I walked through the terminal and there was every other uh, podium had a sign for to join the um, Cathay Pilot Academy. So obviously they're looking at a shortage or at least predicting a shortage. But our, and, and the reason I mention that is because Cathay's paying their cadets to get the training and giving them a stipend like it's a real job. Is that gonna happen in the rest of the world? And I'd, and I'd like to start, uh, you know, look down and let's just move up and see, you know, should the airlines and should the jet aviations and tags of the world be training uh, guys to become pilots? Or do they have any choice but to do that? Uh, well, I think they've got to. I think the worst thing that the industry can do is chuck more money at, at experienced people because it creates a false economy. And we're really seeing now that um, the salaries are going up and up. People are becoming um, a lot less, um, uh, appreciative of the roles that they have within the businesses that they have because money's being thrown at them, they might have young families, um, people just can't down, turn down some of the salaries that are available. So from our perspective, and without wishing to put ourselves out of business, I think what companies should be doing is making sure that they're giving people the flexibility, the work-life balance, um, and the benefits, and investing in them. Um, we have the same problem in recruitment. It's very hard to find experienced, good quality recruiters. Typically, if they're any good, um, they're well looked after. So actually, you know, as a business, we're looking at training our own staff. And I think that that's what aviation, particularly business aviation, needs to do. Because, um, you know, as things like the price of fuel goes up and other costs go up, um, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to spend that on salaries or there won't be any money left. So it's really about developing your own, own teams and own employees. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I, briefly touched upon the, the Far Eastern carriers. I mean, a lot of these Far Eastern carriers now are offering signing on bonuses uh, and large ones at that uh, to, to attract the pilots. I mean, uh, personally, I'd rather stay in Europe, but if I was attracted by uh, um, a, a large signing on bonus to one of the Far Eastern carriers, you, you'd definitely think twice about it. Um, and you know, Liz, what I'd love to do now is maybe you've got a video on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to play it right now, if we can cue the video um, uh, for Liz to comment on. stems from the fact I always like to know how something works before I trust it. Doing an apprenticeship gave me the opportunity to do hands-on things that I wouldn't have done at university. I'm ultimately accountable for people's safety. I lead a large team stripping down aircraft engines. I make sure they're repaired in the most safe way possible. Knowing how they work makes me even more passionate about seeing them in the skies. Uh, that's pretty interesting. So This Is Engineering has got a whole YouTube channel full of fabulous videos like that, which is getting, I think, something like 26 million views and getting views, views from the right demographic that you're wanting to attract into the industry to begin with. There are so many better ways of conversing, I think, than the advertising I've seen. We've got to wake up as an industry. As I said, we've got to be more innovative in the way we bring people in, use social media, 
get, in, get into schools, use live streaming, use the platforms that young people are using themselves to converse. We did an event at Farnborough as Women in Aviation this year at the Farnborough Air Show where we got a group of women from lots of different areas of the industry, different ethnicities, different ages. We had a transgender pilot, we had a wheelchair user, and we had a room full of school kids, all of whom were absolutely rapt when they heard what the women had to say. Aoife was part of it. It was just brilliant. The energy in that room was electric, and the kids were really fired up. This is how they'll respond to seeing cool stuff like this. That's what we've got to be doing now. We've got to converse with younger people in a way, A, face-to-face, -face, and B, in a way that they can understand and relate to. So I have a question, actually, and the gentleman sitting in the row, first row in front of me who's on his device is gonna be answering this question. So let's look at the OEMs for a second. Now, we know that our friends at Embraer moved their operation to Florida, specifically to the Space Coast, because there was availability of engineers there. So, Michael, my question for you is, are you guys facing a shortage now of engineers? If not, do you expect to face one? And, and how are you guys dealing with the, the people shortage in your part of the industry? I didn't know I was going to be on uh, stage today. That's Thanks. what you get for sitting in the Thanks front row. I should have known better when you moderate. Um, no, so seriously, uh, Embraer takes a very proactive uh, measurements, uh, have been very engaged. As Steve mentioned yesterday, Bovard County has 3,500 uh, different aerospace companies, so it's very competitive. So you have to be on the leading edge of it, and you have to do proactive things, uh, not only with the, the, the logicals like Embraer-Riddle and FT, uh, Florida Institute of Technology that are right there local, also the high schools. We do a lot of internships, bring folks in. As far as the question on shortages, we have an unlimited supply of engineers in Brazil, obviously, because we have an actual institute that's dedicated to aeronautical. So we have a little bit of an advantage to bring engineers to the United States. That becomes very expensive to do over time, obviously, either through expatriations or through uh, hiring. So you have to balance that long term. Um, but uh, in general, we're very proactive to make sure that we're um, looking for tools and using those tools to attract. The attraction is not so much the challenge, it's the retention that's the challenge in our space. So we, we, we have plenty of engineers that want to come work for Embraer, and now you, how, how do you keep them motivated, excited, and interested in the things that are necessary to re retain them long term? And so just as much emphasis on, on uh, hiring, you have to do on retention. So if, I, if there's a takeaway from today, it's that we have essentially, if we're not careful, we could have a skills and people shortage across all facets of this industry if we're not careful. How we go about addressing that shortage is really what we as an industry have to approach through diversity as well as increased recruiting efforts both locally, internationally, and in all levels of our educational systems in our respective uh, locales. Um, and that leaves us about 10 minutes left. And what I wanted to do is to leave some time for people to ask some questions. And I have one more comment before oh, we do that. Liz, please, absolutely. Yes, certainly. Um, I invite every single company here to sign up to this, the Women in Aerospace and Aviation Charter, partly because that addresses some of what you're talking about, how do we retain people. And there are, now this is the bit where I need my glasses. So I'll just read you out some of the bullets that will be pertinent, not just for you know, retaining in women who are already in the industry, but in diversity as a whole. Um, organizations committed to promoting gender diversity by having one member of the senior executive team who's responsible and accountable for diversity and inclusion, setting internal targets where appropriate for diversity in the senior management team, publishing progress annually against any targets in reports, and having an intention to ensure the pay of the senior executive team is linked to delivery against those internal targets. And we had a conversation that um, last year, the Boston Consulting Group produced a report that they surveyed 1,700 companies across eight, eight different countries, and a diverse senior management team um, produced an increase in revenues of 19% over one year. So there's a good business case for implementing some of this, not just in gender, 
but in diverse teams in general. And I can echo those comments. Um, I, we've been told internally, at least at City, that those large financial institutions that have a formal diversity program have increased their profitability over their partners who didn't have it by a similar amount. Um, and it's fairly well documented. And also the gender uh, pay equality, the firms that have gender pay equality tend to be more profitable um, and have increased their profits faster than their comparable firms that do not have it. Um, so you're, you're, you're very interesting. Before we go to questions, would the uh, two of you like to say anything else? Sorry? Anything else? Uh, no, no, I'm fine. Any questions, please? Fire yeah, no, no. Just tell your children to go work in aviation, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go to questions. We've got a few minutes left. I know we had some questions that came in. Um, how do we bridge the gap of pilot training? Um, I think you probably already touched upon it, having the airlines and the, and the actual employers pay for a good chunk of training. Um, I certainly, given the cost of education in America right now, you know, seventy thousand dollars plus a year for a private university right now. Uh, throw on top of that the cost of pilot training. I don't know anybody who realistically can afford that. Who's you know middle class or upper middle class at this day and age? So clearly something has to change, and the likewise here in Europe as well. Um, whoa. This is an interesting topic. The psychology of what makes a good corporate pilot. Um, absolutely not the typical nine to five commercial pilot. Um, I would argue, and this is something I tell our clients, um, when we had a family office event that I referenced at the beginning, I said you need to go home and give your pilots a pay increase and have them stop driving your children to school. Um, believe it or not, there are clients out there that still feel that pilots, when they're not flying, are wasting time and they should be washing cars for them, driving their family around and whatnot. It's how you treat that pilot is as important as what you pay him. And um, I know that one of you had a comment about uh, schedules and why pilots are leaving for the commercial airline. Do you care to expand on that? Yeah, absolutely. So that's one of the biggest problems right now is that, um, you know, pilots from a business jet background or in business aviation, there's a lot more expected from them, I think, from, than just turning up and flying from, from A to B. And I'm not wishing to take anything away from um, commercial pilots, um, but I just think that there's a lot more planning involved. There's customer services, keeping the, the owners, the, the, the clients happy. Um, so there's a lot more. Uh, someone mentioned that you probably spend more time planning the trips than you do actually flying them, um, whereas that can be a lot of stress. Um, you don't know where you're flying, when you're flying, how long you're going to be away. And actually, you know, it's totally the opposite, typically in commercial airlines. So, yes. Yeah, and clearly one of the ways to retain pilots in business aviation is to give them the opportunity to at least have some, some semblance of a fixed schedule. And that's the biggest issue I hear from some of the pilots in the industry. I think this goes right into, uh, dovetails well into this question here. Um, how can we give more predictability to pilot schedules? Personally, I don't think we can. I mean, <clears throat> the, this industry that we work in in business aviation is meant to be ever-changing. It's supposed to be last-minute bookings. It's, uh, personally, I don't think we can ever get to a more predictable pilot's roster. Let me give you an idea. How about instead of having two pilots, you have three pilots, so at least you can give people a fixed time off. Does that work or not? At an increased cost, yeah. Yeah, um, so it becomes sort of... It, it, it becomes a circular problem because as the pilot shortage gets more severe, you got to give them more of a schedule, which means you have to hire more pilots, but yet there are fewer pilots from which to recruit. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. I mean, it's the same triangle that we see. It was equality, time, and, uh, and cost. You, you can't have, you can't uh, a lot of the time have all three. You've got to choose two. Okay. Uh, next question up, which is, I think this question gets at a comment that a tech made to me, which is, I can make more money going down to the, and going to work for the local, local Audi dealer than I can for jet aviation as a tech. Um, so do salaries have to imp increase in the, in, the, in the tech world uh, in order to keep these guys from jumping to other uh, industry sectors? Yeah, so um, historically we've always seen business aviation pay higher salaries, particularly on the engineering side for licensed engineers um, than the commercial airlines. Um, but the commercial airline industry is growing at a faster rate compared to business aviation and they just haven't got time to train the engineers uh, or as many as they need. So they're now paying the same, if not more, um, than the business aviation industry. So it is changing. Okay, great. Um, I love this one. Is there a lawyer shortage? I guess we won't go into that because <laughs> we could have fun. There are too many lawyers in the room to actually explore that topic right now. Um, 
Let's see what we've got here. Um, this gets down to the number two here, which is really getting towards the quality of the people applying. Do we, it, this gets to the, or do we have a, Jonathan, I know you mentioned this, do we have a skills shortage or do we have a people shortage or both? Absolutely a skill shortage. Um, that we, um, for instructor positions at CAE, we receive a number, uh, a number of, uh, of, of CVs for an open position or however many positions that we have. Uh, we simply can't hire every person that applies. The, the, reason, the fact of the matter is, is we need more experience. Um, typically, business aviation doesn't hire young pilots out of cadet schools, as, as, as we've seen. Uh, the what the, what they're looking for is 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 the experience, the hours. Whether they've flown for British Airways on a seven four seven, they're looking for the uh, the ten thousand hours of, of of commercial flying. So we have clients that sit there and say, "I'm only going to have a former pilot who flew Air Force One to be my pilot." Um, can, they, can is that a realistic assumption these days on behalf of owners of aircraft? Our clients. Sorry, repeat it. Well, really, the question is. Can owners expect to get the 10,000 hour pilot or the guy who used to fly uh, Air Force One? Is that unrealistic in today's world? I think we, I think they can. I think that's why we're in the predic predicament that we're in now, uh, because they're not hiring the pilots until they find the right one, which is why a lot of operators have gone down from five to four pilots on some aircraft and four to three on a lot of others, because they're not just willing to hire uh, any, uh, any pilot. They want that experience. So, sorry to stick on you, but... Does that mean, therefore, that they're going to dwindle the number of pilots because they're not going to be able to find enough pilots unless they lower their standards? So the question really is, is everybody going to have to lower their standards? I, th I think it is a vicious circle. I think because these, uh, the, when you lower the crew ratio down, these pilots will start to become unhappy because they are being overworked. Uh, they will then start to take uh, or look at offers from the Far East, um, and then they will eventually lower their, uh, their threshold that they, 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 that they want to hire a new pilot. And then the, I think the whole cycle starts again. So this is a really uplifting panel right now. After the Brexit panel before lunch, you guys must be really excited right now. I, I have a question to operators and management companies. Is it really impossible to have these conversations with owners around increasing pilot pay and working conditions for pilots? Is it not kind of on us as an industry to say, well, if we're losing people, if we're not having attractive enough rates and conditions, is there another solution, not just the ones that we're looking at now? Is it really too scary to talk to the owners? Well, Al, I think we have a topic for another event right there. Um, on that, we're over by one minute, but I would like to audience any live questions, one or two live questions before we sign off here. Anybody? Ah, front row, makes it easy, right here. Hey, thank you. Just so from an OEM perspective, a little bit, just to, to give everyone in the room a sense of how, the, the sense of desperation on pilot side. So we have at Bombardier about, we have eight flight departments, not departments. Uh, we have an experimental course in our own customer demo team. The, uh, the amount of pilots who are leaving being offered exorbitant amounts of money by private operators is just, there's always been movement, but that movement has really increased a lot in the last two years, two and a half years. So it's, to me, it's a sign that, yes, uh, we are desperate for pilots as a segment, and uh, we're living that dream, and I'm sure other manufacturers are as well. The other thing I, w I would uh, point out that MBAA just a few days ago, uh, the National Business Aviation Association in America, just uh, issued its uh, annual salary survey uh, uh, for uh, corporate and GA pilots. Uh, salaries are increasing because, um, because of this factor. I think the airlines are, are, are stealing or nabbing pilots. Uh, the question is, are the GA pilots being compensated quickly enough and high enough amounts of money to counter this? Yet another uplifting uh, comment, uh, forward-looking comment here this afternoon. Uh, and on that, I think we'll leave it. Alistair, does that make sense? Um, and I encourage any of you who have questions um, to uh, ask any of the panelists. And also, I encourage you all to look at diversity with a capital D and small d, because it is you know, one leg of the table of solving this problem, and we have to be creative uh, going forward. And Liz has those details. If you'd like to chat with her about that, I'd like to talk about pilot training and whatnot, uh, you've got the other two gentlemen here. So thank you very much, and we look forward to the other panels this afternoon. <laughs>